What's up, everybody? You're listening to SuperiorFandom.com. This is episode 5, part 2. As always, I'm here with my buddy Matt Wong and Chris Vernick. Matt, how are you on this Friday evening? Very good, very hot, and very happy to be here. Uh, you don't have to lie. You could be fair to Midland. You don't have to be that happy <laughs> to be here. This is part 2, after all. Yeah, but um, what else do I got to do on a Friday night in downtown L.A.? I know, sit and talk to me about a a chicken and waffle cone, but more on that later. Chris, how are you, buddy? I'm doing well, Joe. A little conflicted. My Golden Gophers lost in the first round of the hockey tournament today, but the Wild rebounded with a huge win over the Flames, so I'm doing all right. Are they going to make the playoffs? Are they ahead of the Kings? Yeah, uh, yeah, well, the Kings slipped back up into third in the Pacific, so they're in one of those automatic spots for the time being. So the Wild are looking pretty good, but they got a tough schedule. All right, all right. Well, shit, I mean, I know we're off track, but, I mean, that's that's better than Kevin Durant and the uh, OKC Thunder being fucked for the year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. That, that really puts a wrench in your buddy Scott Brooks' plan, doesn't it, Matt? Yeah, but it doesn't put a wrench in Russell... Uh, Westbrook's plan because I think he's actually really happy in a weird way. Can I <laughs> that guy, just that guy likes to score? Yeah, <laughs> hey, me too. I just don't do it as much. <laughs> but um, um, hey, but <laughs> but seriously, I just need to say I think Russell Westbrook is on steroids, and I've got nothing to to back that up except the fact that I watch probably more basketball than anybody that doesn't get paid for it, and I just think he's on the juice. How else do you run around like that? It's possible, and I will say this, and Chris, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but when I first got to know Joe, he, and I knew he knew a crap load about baseball, but one thing that he did that I haven't had somebody do up to this point is he totally called very early that Melky Cabrera was on roids. And, I, you know, this is in two Interesting. And, and it was early, and I was like, I thought he was joking. I'm like, but you kept he kept saying it. I'm like, what, dude? The guy's just hitting or whatever. And then, interesting. Yeah. So so he might be right. I don't know. So no. Joe Joe's your. It's not like the. It's like the roid dar, not the gay dar, but the <laughs> roid dar for you. Like you can just yeah. sniff out who's on. The, what about Gronk? Is Gronk on roids? Probably, dude. I think <laughs> a lot. A lot I think of Gronk just is on like really good blow. To be honest with you. <laughs> he kind yeah. of. He kind of goes full bore. You know, he's kind of just he's kind of just on the never-ending uptick, and I, I've never seen anything quite like that. And I just, I, you know, I just blame the blow. And, and speaking of this, and we're getting way off track, and we said that we were going to talk about a, a bunch of stuff, but but I want to talk to you about a, a former Minnesota Twin, and uh, David Ortiz. Did you hear his comments? about steroids, I don't know if it was today or yesterday, where, where he basically said since he got uh, popped for steroids in 2003 or 2004, whatever that was, that, that he's been tested something on the order of, of 200 times and hasn't uh, failed a, a test since then and basically uh, call, called everything, uh, you know, basically called bullshit on everybody. And uh, said that he deserved to be on the Hall of Fame. Have you uh, heard anything about this? Just uh, I've I've read a little bit about <clears throat> a little bit about it, but uh, you know what do you expect from somebody who's been on that list? And I forget was was Poppy was he on the Mitchell Report? I, I mean, think I he know, is. Yeah, I believe he is too. So I mean, I, I mean, what what do you expect him to say that you know? He, he's out here slugging. He's trying to win an, another ring this season, and he's going to say, ah, you know what, I don't think I should be eligible for Cooperstown. I, I'm really remorseful. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I, and to some degree, and we've had this discussion with Bonds and about all the, some of the greatest sluggers of the last, last 30 years have essentially been, you know, ditched out of blackballed out of the game, except for McGuire, who got a job with the Dodgers somehow. But, um, I mean, there are, don't you know, get me started on that. I, you know, I, I don't know. understand <laughs> how he's a hitting coach. No, well, that's but a I mean, strong take on that one. But, uh, I mean, it, but they, they have a, a, I think they're legitimately, they legitimately have a beef because they, you know, steroids, the whole McGuire Sosa home run chase and, 98 was it i think that that brought baseball back from the strike baseball wasn't doing that well the first couple of years after the strike and it was really that mcguire and sosa thing that that really got 
the whole nation back into the game. And it only progressed from there with, you know, what Bonds was able to do. Uh, and they brought baseball back. And that's kind of the deal with the devil that Bud Selig made, you know, whether you want to say he turned the blind eye or whatever. But that's we wouldn't baseball wouldn't be in the financial position that it's in now without having gone through that. It just it wouldn't be. Yeah, completely agree. And I mean, really, like being a little bit younger than you guys, too, like some of the coolest baseball games that I remember going to were, you know, seeing Barry Bonds and Sammy Sosa play a game uh, at Candlestick Park. And I, I want to say this was, you know, 98, right before uh, right before AT&T opened. Um, and they hit a combined five home runs in one game. And it was just Holy. like the, the raddest Holy. fucking thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and I was just like, wow. And from, from that point forward, like... Barry Bonds was my favorite player, and the Giants were the Giants, and, um, you know, fucking kind of, the, the rest was history, and, and everybody talks shit about Bud Selig and how baseball was, you know, and is slow to, um, you know, innovate and things of that nature, but, but it's definitely the healthiest, um, you know, American sport, and maybe, maybe even the healthiest sport in the world when, when you look at it. Uh, you know, in a, in a purely economic sense, and, you know, definitely, one, like, the only American-based sport that um, hasn't had a work stoppage in the last 20 years, so, um, you know, I mean, I, I just, a lot of people give him shit, and I mean, I know that he didn't maybe do everything perfect, but, but he got baseball out of a really dark age, and I think he did his job wonderfully. Business wise, there's no doubt, and I and I do like, um, I do like the wild card. Yeah, fuck yeah. Oh, no. absolutely. I do not like though, and I know we don't want to go here. Chris and I have talked about this before, but I I I have never been in love with um, interleague. But I get it. I mean, it's yeah. not like it's it's not a deal breaker. Yeah. I mean, Whatever. I, I've been in love with parts of interleague, and they they can fix it. But I mean, you know. It's not if, a big deal. If that's the biggest bitch I have about 162 uh, game baseball schedule, you know, whatever. And I, and I think, like, the A's and the Giants games are cool. And I think, Chris, you got to be pro, like, the Twins and the Brewers and, like, the, the Crosstown rivalry or however you want to word that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty bitching. Yeah, oh, I think yeah. they could probably cut down on the number and maybe tweak it a little bit. But yeah, I mean, it, like like you're saying, if that's the worst thing that we've got going in the game, then that you know we're doing pretty well. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Fun. So, um, I mean, the reason we're doing part two of this podcast to be completely straightforward with all four of the people that actually listen to this that are not the three of us that just like to hear ourselves talk is because I, I heard uh, the the. I guess the the findings of the USC um, recruiting sanctions and, and kind of how that whole process went down a few years back were made public, and and I just wanted to get your guys' takes on this because I know Chris that you're really into college football, and Matt, you're uh, you know for for reasons that I don't quite understand are, are very anti uh, private school. And I'm pro- <laughs> and I'm probably um, you know really. one of the more devout USC Trojans athletic supporters um, of all sports that, that I know in Los Angeles. So I, I, I thought it would be a hot button topic. But before we get into that, um, I, I just want to make it a point that the Giants and the Dodgers are playing right now, and I live in downtown Los Angeles and uh, spend money on an annualized basis. For the uh, MLB package. And uh, I can't, along with 70% of other people in L.A., cannot watch uh, this baseball game that also happens to be the first game that the legendary Ben Scully is calling all spring. And for all we know, it might be his last first spring training game. Uh, And and Matt, I mean, do do you have anything you want to add to this? I just think it's complete horseshit that they... Can't find some way to work this out in the interim. Oh, uh, that's Charlie. Okay. No, yeah. Um, I was trying to get us a little vin there off the radio, but you know how they go back and forth. Um, yeah. Actually, I don't. I can't watch it. 
<laughs> well, I only got them from, from the ra- yeah the radio. No, it's 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 horseshit. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, very, very simply and well said. Very eloquent, sir. It's like you're a writer or something. <laughs> yeah, I like to describe it, you know. Um, Chris on the twin stick. I uh, I heard Tommy Malone had some uh, some choice words as it was uh, brought to his attention today that he might have to um, start the year in the bullpen in favor of some of the twins' young talent. Do you want to uh, fill everybody on it? on uh, what happened in Florida today? Yeah, I mean, it looks like the, the young kid, Trevor May, may get that uh, that fifth spot. And one of the beat writers asked Tommy Malone about his thoughts on possibly beginning the year in the bullpen, which is a position that he's never, he's never, he's always been a starter in his big league career. And he did, I mean, choice words, he didn't really, it wasn't anything too terrible. He just kind of, kind of tepidly said something like, well, it's a little late in the game for me to have to switch positions, so it's going to be interesting to see if I can make the adjustment in time. You know, something like that, which is kind of, if you read between the lines a little bit, he's a little irked by that, I think, and uh, it, we'll just we'll, we'll see what happens. I would imagine uh, eventually he's going to make his way into that rotation, whether it's because some of the other guys don't perform or there's injuries uh, if he doesn't make his way into that rotation, that means things must be going damn well for the Twins. Didn't Tommy Malone also get kind of booted out of the A's rotation too, if I'm not mistaken? Well, I think he got he ended up losing his spot. Remember, uh, before the trade deadline last year, even well before July 31st, they made that deal for uh, Hamels, or Hamill, is it? Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, I'm not. This is before. Yeah, John Jason, Lester. Jason Hamill and Jeff Samarjo when they both came over yes, from the Cubs. Yes, it was when for it was Addie when the, Russell. Yep, that's when he he got bumped. He, they, and they actually had to option him to AAA because they literally didn't even they weren't going to put him in the bullpen, and so he went down to AAA. And that's a few weeks later, or about a month later, that's when the the Twins ended up getting him. That shows to me, though, and because I actually had him on my fantasy team a couple, a little bit last year, uh, and he actually put in some really decent numbers. But it shows to me that the Twins staff might, you know, be pointed in the right direction then, because I mean, he's Tommy Malone, you know, could be a fifth, I think, on some other other clubs. Unquestionably, I mean, on paper, this is the best rotation they've had since 2010 I mean there's no doubt I mean if this were last year if this were any of the last three or four years Tommy Malone would probably be easily the number four starter forget the number five starter so yeah I mean definitely on paper they have more depth than they've had in probably a half a decade that's good that's awesome and hey speaking of Tommy Malone I do believe he is a uh, USC Trojan. Before we uh, <laughs> before we before we uh, uh, kind of transfer into this topic, um, Chris, you you were the one that kind of uh, kind of brought it to my attention. I think Matt and I are definitely from uh, opposing poles of of this discussion. So like, I, I figure we start out with kind of the neutral take in Switzerland and just kind of see your thoughts on on. Uh, you know how you thought USC kind of got put through the ringer in terms of recruiting sanctions or, or not? Like, what, what were your thoughts on this? Well, my thoughts have always been, and I'm not going to get into the minutia of, of, the, of what happened because nobody's, nobody really wants to hear that, so I'll try to stay at 30,000 feet here. But there's, there's no question that, you know, any idea, any concept that there was a you know a lack of institutional control or whatever it was, I I don't believe that's that's true. And if Dennis Dodd of, of CBS Sports, he re- released a, a, an article earlier this week that sort of dug into the kind of the the dirt underneath the grass, if you will, kind of like a, a blue velvet where they go under and you see all the bugs underneath the grass or whatever. And <laughs> it, it's clear that many of the authorities in the NCAA had it in for USC, like right from the get go in that whole thing. I mean, there was, I mean, it was almost malicious, their viewpoint here. And you can see that if you read the piece, because he even includes direct quotes from some of these people from email correspondence and things like that. But 
I mean, what happened at USC? I mean, th- I hate to use that cliche that oh, it happens everywhere else, but I mean, if you if you just take if you just stop and look at, at what's happened since the USC uh, sanctions came down, the NCAA that was really sort of their own death knell, and and whether people don't like USC or whatever all over the country, but I think that really did tick off a lot of it, it's, scared a lot of other athletic directors around the country because you're running, you know, these are businesses. I mean, uh, in universities, the football programs are a huge, that's probably their number one moneymaker behind straight up tuition. You know what I mean? So, so I think they were a little scared at what happened to USC because it's no coincidence that ever since then, the NCAA's clout and power has just completely gone off the cliff. I mean, look what they, they tried with Ohio State. Ohio State ended up basically getting a slap on the wrist compared to what happened to USC. Penn State, well, they tried to get, be tough with Penn State, but here after a year or two, they've pretty much rescinded everything that they, they threw on Penn State. So Penn State's basically done with everything now. And on top of all that, all of the, the the six power conferences have essentially said, screw you to the NCAA. It's like, you're going to do what we want, or we're just going to go form our own subdivision. And the NCAA, with just within the last several months, has kind of, they're completely on a leash at this point. And I do believe that it goes right back to that USC thing, because I think that scared, you know, Mike Slive in the uh, SEC, Jim Delaney in the Big Ten. They realize, hey, if, if they're going to go after, if they could take down a program like USC, who's had this decade long run of incredible success. What happens if they come after Alabama for, for some rinky dink thing that, that, you know, if if you dig, if you dig deep enough in any program, you're going to find dirt. And that's just, uh, I I think the NCAA kind of got its comeuppance because they, they laid it heavy on USC, but they ended up, I think, writing their own, uh, digging their own grave uh, with what they did. I do basically tend to agree with what you said, Matt. Before I jump in here, um, I know that that you're kind of, um, I don't know, anti the the private school and maybe have a a different, a little bit more like USC had this coming kind of viewpoint. Uh, Do do you want to jump in and agree or disagree with any part of this? I'll get in really quick and then, you know, you can nail it or whatever later. But, yeah, I would say... um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not necessarily anti-private school. I mean, I am not an SC, SC fan at all. But then that's just growing up, following other teams. But one one take um, I, I've heard on this. One way to look at it, it's kind of like when a cop pulls you over. You know, even though maybe the cop is is really being an asshole and giving you a bad ticket or whatever. What, it, what USC did, I think, to an extent, is possibly tried to compete with the NCAA. Just like, you know, you're going to lose that battle every time. Like, just like a cop is going to win the battle, even if the dude is huge sitting in the car. Right. And maybe, because I guess what I would say is, I, 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 I think that they really overstepped too, and I agree with Chris that it's kind of blown up back on them, because in no way is the NCAA, like, into you know something that I want to defend either, um, but but maybe it, I, I guess you could look at it as shouldn't they knew shouldn't have SC known that that was going to come or shouldn't have they maybe try to get ahead of it or be a little more aware of it? And last thing I'll say is um, and this is per Petros who can you know can be seen as anti SC. I don't know if that's really true, but he says the culture of um, you know, the culture at the time was to always compete. Pete Carroll, you know, always win. Everything is something that a competition that you compete in. And if you're yep. trying to compete and win this against, you know, the NCAA, you're going to lose. And that's what happened. I don't know. But last thing I'll say is I, I basically am agree- agreeing with you guys that it was way, way too much compared to some of the, you know, the other rulings. Yeah. So, so many, like, Basically, a, a lot of the a lot of the sanctions came down on the on the former USC recruiting. I guess I guess the coordinator that the guy's name was Todd McNair, um, and, and 
basically there's and I'll paraphrase this quote, but but the one of the one of the guys on the committee said I don't think the committee should be changed by an enforcement staff that has seemed to have fallen short of the in investigation of the institution that has no intention of having us find out what the, what actually happened here. I was insulted by the arguments made by the institution and embarrassed by the reaction of the staff. Uh, the USC coach is a lying, morally bankrupt, in my view, and a hypocrite of the highest order and should not have a job within coaching any sport or institution within the NCAA. Now, when I read that... Yeah. I... I I mean, I just, that sounds like a personal attack to me. Yes, you, yes, you, it does. You, you, know, you know what Very I mean? Cool. Like, I, I don't know what what rules they necessarily broke or the severity of what they broke, but when I read that quote, that sounds like it doesn't matter what evidence we have or who we're going to tell. This guy's a morally bankrupt hypocrite of the highest order and we're going to do everything we can to shit can the guy and, and, I, and I just feel like okay wonderful but let's let's really look at this for what it is I, I, I feel like the NCAA slaps the most severe penalties of across the board in all sports to the institutions that are building a brand ba that that can compete with the NCAA for the overall power struggle of the whole thing. When you look at when you look at how they stripped the Fab Five of their basketball titles, that that probably didn't have as much to do with anything that went wrong or right. Because let, let's be honest, they can afford to, to solve the problems for these kids. It's it's just a, a a matter of remaining in a sense of power so that their organization can can keep running. And I think USC just got smacked with the hardest line because they were competing against the NCAA and, and it just became a, a personal war. And, and I just look at this, and, and I think, sure, there's a lot of, of institutions that, that, you know, get recruiting violations that do, like you said, Matt, by the letter of the law, break the rules. And, and for that should be punished. But I think those individual institutions, or at least many of them, still want to, um, you know, prepare student-athletes for life after college, you know, you you look at you look at uh, schools like Kentucky, and we're in a really bad part of downtown Los Angeles, by the way. That's the NCAA right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, They're or, coming to get me, dude. They're cracking down. But or speaking of speaking of SC, I mean, yeah, we're right? we're in the we're in the we are here. Yeah. But but no, you you look at these you look at these schools like Kentucky basketball now they've. They've, um, you know, the people who have come out of that program since John Calipari have been there have made $650 million in NBA contracts. That's a pretty good track record of, of preparing student athletes to have jobs and work and support their families and be mem uh, positive members of society. And you look at, you look at stuff like the, the Ray Rice situation or the, the um, uh, Aaron Hernandez trial, the, those guys are like beating women and, and allegedly killing people and things of that nature. And there's, there's no penalty against those institutions for not preparing their student athletes to be positive members of society. But, but the second that there's a brand that contends with the NCAA, like the Fab Five what, that, that created you know, three professional basketball players and two successful media moguls and, and and the like. Like, that's the shit that gets busted. And I just think it's, I don't know, I just think that that's what's completely warped about this situation. Um, and I don't want that to get lost, you know? 
And unfortunately for USC, USC is sort of the, the one that got, they were sort of the last institution that really got their butt kicked by the NCAA. Because as we've talked about, the NCAA has really, since then, just in the last you know couple of years, or even in the last couple of months, they've really had to bow down to the, the will of the, the six uh, athletic directors of the big conferences. Because at some point, all these schools, these big schools, you know, the SEC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, uh, they realize that, wait a minute, we don't even need the NCAA. We could just form our own our own subdivision. There was even talk about they were going to call it, um, what were they going to call it, D4 or something like that, that, where you literally just had the six conferences forming their own subdivision. And there was even talk last year about how they might just leave from the NCAA and form their own league themselves. Dennis Dodd of CBS, the same guy who wrote this USC article, was writing all all kinds of stuff about that. And all those options were discussed uh, by these athletic directors. So uh, to your point, yeah, I mean, USC was sort of the last one to, to stand up to the NCAA. They got their butts kicked. They lost, like you were saying, Matt. Like you just, if you stand up to, if you fight, you know, I fought the law. The law won. Well, that's how it turned out. But then, like, if there's any silver lining for USC, which there's probably not, because they had to pay the price for all those sanctions, and none of which were relieved at all. Unlike Penn State, uh, it's that the NCAA has sort of been neutered uh, in the the five or what, the four or five years since since all that went down. Hey, if I could jump in real quick. Um, what, I, what I would wonder then is that if, if it got exasperated and got way worse, you know, when, um, when, when USC started to fight with them, right? But I would go further upstream then. What, why were they all over them? Like if, if it wasn't, if it, if it wasn't only from the fighting, because the fighting takes place after it starts, right? Right. And then, and then, and then, that's what we can all focus on. But something had to happen before then, right? And I'm just wondering, like Joe was maybe, you know, maybe was there was there a vendetta there already? And if there was, what what helped create that vendetta? Because we're not just saying that that it all started from just some person neutrally outside of the program coming in and having something against SC. Sure, and, and Matt, to, to your point, I, I do think, and, and this was kind of what I, what I tried to get at, and maybe I, maybe I danced around it a little bit and wasn't clear, but, but that, that's what I mean, like, in, in these situations, like, with USC and the Fab Five, like, before they were ever busted, they were building a brand around flamboyance, trying to make their brand you know, stronger or more attractive, if you will, in the NCAA. Like, if you remember back to the, the prime of the Pete Carroll era, um, Snoop Dogg was was on the sideline of every game. Snoop Dogg was at every right. practice. Will Ferrell. Will, will Ferrell, Ferrell would go into yep. the meeting rooms. And, and hang out like they they would get they would just get ungodly amounts of in and out dropped off by like Dr. Dre um <laughs> you, you know what I mean and it's just like they, they did kind of like put it in their face a little bit you know what I mean and and, if, and the, like USC wasn't the, the first program to do this um and, and not even in the first sport like you you look at the fab five when when you know, the University of Michigan went with their, their baggy shorts and the black socks and the black shirts and, the, and you know, starting all the freshmen or, like, um, you know, things of, things of that nature. Like, they, they got busted and busted hard. You, you know what I mean? And, and you got somebody like Jerry Sandusky at Penn State who, who did what he did, which is just, like, uh, atrocious on every level and way more severe than any of uh, any any possible recruiting violation could ever be, and, and that gets like wiped off and and, and spit shined without a second thought. And it just it just seems like such a back ass words priority of like how to solve problems. And the and the the thing is, I I don't think uh, you know to this point there's been any like earnest effort from the NCAA to solve the problem because it's 
it's not a hard one to solve. Like, let let the kids earn a little bit of money or at least have a, a job in the offseason like every other college kid. Well, they, they are now, and that's the, the NCAA was never going to budge on that, and that's part of the reason why Mike's live, Jim Delaney, and these other guys – so what they just had a great awakening to use a historical term one day saying we don't need the NCAA like we we are the ones that control the the base of operations here we don't need the NCAA and that's why they just basically issued a a they basically went to the NCAA and said here's how it's going to be they read them the riot act and basically gave the NCAA an ultimatum saying you either agree to everything on this list or we're Seacrest out. And mm. of course the NCAA completely bowed down to all of it. And now you are, you are going to see players getting stipends and, and, and things like that. And you'll probably even, I don't know what that's going to mean for uh, the in, um, investigation and enforcement of, of various infractions. Maybe they're going to go away. I don't know. Uh, they're not going to go away, but it may not be as bulky as we've seen in the past, but that's essentially what happened. What's really weird is it's, it's pretty, and you guys know more about this than I do, but it sounds fairly short-sighted, especially if what Joe's saying is, is basically, uh, true or there's, uh, that must be a big factor in what's going on. But it seems to me that long-term Having a strong, flamboyant SC, if you want to throw the word flamboyant in there, or, and having a strong, you know, attracting Michigan and, you know, whatever else you want to throw out there in the country, you know, even Oregon to an extent is, is good yeah, for totally. the game. Yeah, totally. Oregon's for a the great game. example, by the way. Oregon but isn't that is a good, great example. Isn't that good for the game? Isn't, like, if it's about money, but maybe it's, it, maybe you're saying, Joe, that these guys are putting money in their specific pockets but if it's about money for the whole game it seems like you wouldn't want to cut those 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 real fun teams down if you will you would want to let them you know prosper let lendale white be lendale white i mean nobody knew back in the heyday of usc <laughs> right Jeff? Bro. lendale white was not he was not a chaste young man he was not reading books before going to bed at night <laughs> <laughs> i heard a I heard a story from a from a very good friend of mine that that I call him the fat gay Jew and we'll just leave it at that. But uh, I heard that I heard that Lindale White rolls the best joints on the USC campus. <laughs> Still to this day, which is kind of scary. That would fit, right? <laughs> right? No shit, huh? Um, no, I mean, let, let me ask you this: you you br- you bring up the point of Oregon, and we're getting off the rails, and like I, maybe I don't give a shit because maybe no one listens to this, or maybe they do. I don't know. Um, do you think Oregon gets away with shit because of Uncle Phil, and Uncle Phil's got uh, you know the NCAA by the balls because of who he is, Matt? Hey, that's interesting. I was gonna say like, well, then if. If we're going to follow suit here, except for what you're saying, Chris, now they're kind of backing down. But if the NCAA was going to act like they act, it seems like Oregon would be next. If, if In your theory, Joe, of like these teams that become, quote, bigger, you know. But, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it, that's hard to say because if it's all about money in the end, which I guess everything is, well, you know, Mr. Well, it- Mr. Nike's got a lot of money, so – wasn't Oregon just under investigation for something, and then it seemed to just like go away? Same thing with Miami. Uh, what happened to that? Remember, for a while they were taking like a, like a couple years ago, like Miami was going to get buried, and then it just kind of went away. And now there there's there's nothing. Remember Al Golden? Right after he got hired, Miami got involved in in all these scandals or whatever. They were being investigated, and there was talk about uh, Al Golden wanting to get out of there, and then all. All of a sudden, a couple years later, just nothing ever came of it. It just kind of petered out, and you never heard a thing about it. It's the it's same just, with, yeah, with Chip Kelly. He Yes, he, exactly. He, he kind of escaped in the same – like people were saying, oh, he's doing the Pete Carroll route and everything. But what's weird is is that he doesn't it, – it just went away. Whereas yeah, where, the hammer got never the, dropped. No, yeah, exactly. Whereas it did on Carroll. So I don't it, – it's it's crazy. I, it, I, I, I don't know how to navigate it all, but what you guys are saying makes sense. I just feel like the NCAA is 
nothing but a 21st century glorified slave organization. And, and I just, I don't know who's going to, I don't know who or how it's going to get infiltrated, but, but I, I just feel like it needs infiltrated. And I, and I hope that, you know, somebody can, you know, whether it's a, whether it's a, an organization, uh, you know, schools coming together to find a new league, I just, I just hope that ultimately justice will prevail. You know, well, it pretty much already ha it pretty much already has. It, it happened like last in 2014 uh, during the like last summer is when they basically uh, told the NCAA how things are going to be moving forward. Players are going to get stipends, this and that. And there's other there's other things too in terms of I think I think even the number of scholarships for football is even and basketball are even up for debate too like they might get more scholarships and things things that the NCAA had historically really drawn a line in the sand on those things are all up for negotiation now and student athletes can work now too as well correct yeah i believe they can yep yeah that i mean you know hopefully hopefully some of this wealth trickles down you know what i mean and it's not such a you know such a just a slave show and, and if it is going to be that like i just hope that some of these institutions some of these schools take the impetus to actually educate these guys and, and you see the crime rates of you know some of these some of these young pro athletes come into into the the what do you say like the the professional lifestyle like prepared yeah. to be a professional athlete and you know, in every sense of the word, not just the on the field shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, that that's what I got, and this is a good talk. And uh, Chris, before I get out of here, well, you you showed me that Bloody Mary uh, last night. The what what do they call that? The Herbeck at the, uh, at Tarvik Field. The College Days Bloody Mary. That's what it is, but and. Uh, I, I I was looking around today at other ballpark food. I'm trying to plan a couple baseball trips. And I saw in Houston today that they are unveiling a chicken and waffle cone. This is going to be a, waff, a soft waffle ice cream style cone filled with popcorn chicken, mashed potatoes, and honey mustard. And I, I just got to tell you. I think I am in heaven. So it's kind of like a wrap, I guess, in a, in a way? No, I mean, I'll put, <laughs> we'll put a picture of it online. But, but it, honest to God, it looks like an ice cream cone with chicken and, like, mashed potatoes and gravy. And, like, instead of, like, hot fudge or whatever or what have you on top of the ice cream cone, it's literally honey mustard instead. Well, I guess all the stoners are going to be migrating to Minute Maid Park this summer. I'm telling you, man. They, they got to do something to get up there, man. Like, you, you know what I mean? I, I don't know if Sabermetrics and George Springer are, are exactly enough to be filling up the Crawford boxes. I like that little mound, though, in, in center field. Yeah, what that's, the hell that's is that? That's crazy. As, that's crazy, man. I, like, I, you, run, you run up a hill, and isn't, isn't, then isn't there, like, a pole in there, too, or something? I don't like, know. Like, there used to be, there uh, used to be one up there, and I, I've even heard that they're even considering taking that out of there. That yeah, that little hill, because it's kind of it's kind of like playing in your backyard or something. Yeah, I don't know what's more strange, that hill in the middle of center field that the Astros have, or the structure fucking fountain thing that they have in left center field of uh, of uh, the Marlins Park. I just hope that before too long, Giancarlo Stanton. Just breaks that thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just sends a couple bombs in there. Yeah. Um. I don't know. That's all I got for tonight, guys. Uh, thank you for for spending your Friday evening with me. It's been a an awesome week in the uh, Superior Fandom world, and I just want to thank you both for your energy. Hey, thank Our you. Our pleasure. Yeah, I loved it. It's fun. Fuck yeah! Right on, guys. Well, we will touch base next week. Be sure to uh. Follow us at Superior Fandom on Twitter, also Superior Fandom on Facebook. Uh, you can check out all of our posts, written and audio, at superiorfandom.com. We'll catch you guys next week sometime. Peace.